All right. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome to the Hawaii Volcanoes National Parks After Dark in the Park program. I'm glad everybody came out tonight. Um, Dr. Scott Rowland is uh, from the University of Hawaii. He actually is a professor there, University of Hawaii in Manoa. Um, whenever I invite speakers, I always try to research them, and I was just blown away. If you were one of his students, you would have taken classes such as Dynamic Earth Lab, Geology of the Hawaiian Islands, Volcanoes in the Sea, Geologic Hazards, Geological Field Methods, Geology of Alaska and Hawaii, Geological Remote Sensing, Geospatial Information. Was I close? That's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and that's just some of the classes he's taught. Incredible. Um, his research interests have been volcanology, geology of Hawaii, remote sensing of volcanoes. Um, I first heard about Dr. Rowland as he was doing some work with the Mars rovers, and I was really impressed. I was like, wow. Um, he's now a faculty member in the very same department in which he earned his doctorate. He spends most of his time teaching and pursuing his three main research projects now, modeling how channelized lava flows advance, mapping thick lava flows on the island of Molokai, and slightly further afield, he continues to assign ongoing operational directions to the Mars Curiosity rover a few times a month. So uh, he's, he's kind of spread out, right? <laughs> um, it is really a privilege to welcome him here to the After Dark in the Park uh, Kilway Visitor Center Auditorium. Dr. Scott Lowe. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, mahalo for inviting me and for, com for coming out. Mahalo for um, the Park Service and HBO for, for making the, the trip possible. Um, this, is, this is kind of a blast for the past for me, not because I was here in 1919, <laughs> um, but because 26 years ago, a, a grad student named Duncan Monroe and I wrote a paper about Mauna Iki. And I'm guessing that that is the reason why I'm the one who got asked to come talk about an eruption that happened 100, 100 years ago. And um, if you, this is the acknowledgment section of the paper here. And there might be some, some familiar names there, the people who helped review the paper. T. Neal, T. Wright, D. Zerishan, J. Dvorak, A. Okamura, J. Koenkawa, and D. Thomas. Um, if you're not familiar with publishing papers in scientific journals, um, it's important to acknowledge your reviewers because it's a polite thing to do, and because reviewers of papers really, really help. A good review makes a paper much better. And to this day, there's something that I forgot to put in the paper that Tina Neal told me to put in, or suggested I put in, that I'm really glad it was there. Um, I, I'm still embarrassed that I didn't think of it all myself. And that is that we could not have written this paper had not there been careful field measurements by HBO geologists back in 1919 and 1920. At the time, there were two of them. Um, but they made, in some cases, daily measurements of the level of Halimau'u Lava Lake. Um, they would hike out into Kau'u Desert to look at what Mauna Iki was doing. Um, so it's still important today. Being out in the field, making careful measurements and observations, noting where they are, what time they are, what day they are, all that kind of stuff is the same as it was 100 years ago. <coughs> Similarly, I need to thank, um, well, Thomas Jagger, who wrote a lot. And so he, you know, it's a lot of material that he wrote. And then Darcy Bevins, Jane Takahashi, and Tom Wright um, compiled the early serial um, publications and the weekly reports from HBO into this, it's actually three volumes, these kind of orange books here, that make those extensive field observations and measurements easily available. And so we relied very heavily on these two volumes. And then finally, the other reason why I sort of know Mami is that it's a really, really good place to teach geologists about volcanic surfaces, particularly with respect to remote sensing. And, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the very end. Um, I'm going to try and, and briefly talk about what are, what are some other things that were going on at the time. Uh, what had Kilauea been, what had Kilauea been up to? Um, then I'll go through a timeline of the eruption. Um, and you know, you folks lived through the Kilauea eruption last year. You, you know that eruption really well. Um, the timeline from 100 years ago is not quite as detailed, but it, it's, you know, obviously they were making measurements and looking at things. Um, and I have to admit, I was, you know, I don't usually read my own papers again. It seems kind of narcissistic, but I, I had to do it to get ready for this. And I was 
I'd forgotten a lot of it. Um, I was struck by some of the similarities between what happened on the Southwest Drift Zone 100 years ago and what happened on the East Drift Zone and Summit one year ago. Certainly nothing close to the degree of the eruption, the, the vigor of the eruption, um, the volumes, you know, the, the big explosions. There was none, none of that happening 100 years ago. But the interplay between summit activity and rift zone activity was going on back in, back in 1919. And it was, it was kind of interesting. I, was, I, I had forgotten how similar those things were. Um, a few things about what, what we've learned and observed and, and why people care about Mauna um, today. This is the part of the world we're talking about. Um, I, I should say that back in when, when Duncan and I wrote this paper, this was pre-PowerPoint. Um, for me, at least, it was pre-computer graphics, so all our figures were drawn by hand with pens and paper. Um, and I'm a pack rat. I saved all those figures. Um, and so I was able to scan them for you folks. I, so I hope you don't mind I didn't redraw them for, for PowerPoint. But anyway, um, Summit Caldera up here. Um, the W stands for the Whitney Vault, and that will become important a little bit later on. Mauna Iki is down here about um, nine, six to nine kilometers um, downrift of, of um, the, the, the summit. Uh, the Keha Moku flow is a Mauna Loa flow that's nearby, um, and that's, that's part of the world we're talking about. Okay, what was going on? Well, World War I had just ended. So 1919 was pretty grim times. Um, the war was obviously awful. About 40 million people were killed during World War I. Even worse, with respect to death, death toll, was the influenza pandemic um, that killed 50 million people. Um, 642 here in Hawaii. Um, I, one, one reference I saw when I was looking up to this, they, they estimate that 20% of the world's population caught the flu and 10% of them died. So it was incredibly awful. Oops. Um, closer to home, um, uh, Jonah Kuhio was our our representative to Congress for the territory, and he proposed statehood for Hawaii back in 1919. It took another 40 years to actually happen. Um, and geologically, Mauna Loa erupted in sort of late September to early November time, um, producing the Alika flow. And this is this photograph and the descriptions of the eruption launched a thousand misconceptions about Ahoy Hoi and Aha, which is faster and and how fast the lava flows move, but we won't talk about those. Kilauea uh, was known at the time for the lava lake at Halimau, and from the time that Westerners arrived and first saw the, the summit um, until this time, 1919, there had been a lava lake at, in Halimau, and it went up and it went down. Um, sometimes it went high enough to spill out onto the floor of Kilauea, and you read about um, in some of those old uh, descriptions of the postal rift flow. It took me a long time to figure out, what are we talking about postal rift flow? But basically, it was a flow that spilled out of Halemakumau onto the caldera floor, and tourists would walk up to the edge of it and singe postcards and then send them home. And that's, that's where that flow got, it, got its name. Um, this is what it looked like in 2000, uh, sorry, oh, 2017, sorry, 1917, excuse me. I didn't catch all the titles. Uh, 1917, sorry. Um, and Thomas Jagger would, would go on almost daily and make observations and measurements of the height of the level there. And, and he also made these, um, these maps. And I don't know why he chose white on black, uh, but in these maps, the white color is molten lava. And so here's a map, and then here's a cross, cross section. All right, you're going to see this a bunch of times, and there's lots of words, so don't panic. Um, each time, what we care about is the yellow part, okay? So we'll go through this. So pre-eruption, Halemaumau Lava Lake was fluctuating up and down, occasionally overflowing. On November 28th of 1919, the lake level dropped 180 meters in four hours. So that's a pretty, con pretty considerable drop. And it was pretty quiet. There were a few small earthquakes, but otherwise it was just draining away. Um, it was not erupting anywhere. Um, there was one seismometer, so, so maybe there were some small earthquakes, but they were not really tracked by, by the seismic activity. And then in the next 17 days or so, it refilled. So this, this is 
you know, something was going on, but at the time it was not easy to tell what, what that something was. Um, I cheated a little bit. This is a photograph from a similar draining away in 1921. I could not find a photograph of what Halimut looked like after the 1919 drain out event, but the descriptions are very similar. Importantly, both in 1921 and in 1919, they describe these large caverns on both the southwest rift side and then, in the, this case, underneath where the photographer was, the east rift side, leading off into the depths. Right? So along both, at the base of the Holy Mountain Wall, once the lake drained away, there were these big caverns that, that drained off down, down the rift zones. Um, and again, the, after that rather dramatic draining away, it, the lava came back. And, and here's what it looked like December 16th of 1919. Um, some of this material here is rubble that formed during that collapse, and it just rolled, rolled the elevator back up as the lake, as the lake um, recovered. Uh, OK, so Duncan and I divided the eruption into four stages based on the really good detailed descriptions of the activity based on some of the geophysical measurements that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and so that's these, these stages one through, one through four. Um, they're not super well defined in some cases, but we had, you know, it really helped to think about what was going on by, by dividing it up into these stages. Stage one, uh, sort of mid-December till uh, for, you know, basically only a week or so, there was a short-lived caldera eruption, right? It's the southwest of Halimokmo. The lava lake level dro dropped and then rose a little bit. Um, and also part of stage one, there was a dike propagating down the southwest rift zone. So cracks were opening up. Some of those cracks had lava in them. They could look down and see the lava. Others, it was just fumes. Others, they were just, they were just cracks. Uh, I, this is the only photo I could find of the actual eruption in the caldera. And black and white, of course, is a little hard to tell. But it looks as if there's lava pooling um, between the, the southwest wall of the caldera and uh, the slightly higher rim of Halimokmo. Halimokmo, not anymore, but um, at the time and prior to 2018, the rim was actually higher than the, most of the floor of the, of the caldera. And that's because of all the times it had overflowed, it had built up its, its rim a little bit. So it was easy for lava to kind of pool against the walls. Um, this photograph here shows some lava that sort of flowed on the surface and then drained down into an old skylight. It's actually not active in this photo. This is just kind of a frozen lava falls. Here are some, there are a number of photographs of the cracks that are going down the, the southwest drift zone. Um, here are some that are just emitting steam. Um, here are some where you can't really see anything down there, although I don't know about this one, but I mean, you can see something. I don't know if that's active or not. Um, but there were a number of them where they actually could look down into the crack and see the, basically the top of the dike, the top of the dike propagating its way down the rift, down the rift zone. Um, and here's First. kind of a little old guy standing in the, in the crack there. <laughs> um, and it probably looks something like this. This, this is out near Pugo'o back in 1985. Um, and there was a small dike that propagated uprift from Pugo'o, and we were able to stand on the side and see basically the tops of those dikes, and the, and the lava would rise up. And in this case, it only rose this far and then drained back down again. But you can see in the background, it rose high enough to erupt. So this is probably what it, what it looked like. Um, and again, because of those careful dated time measurements, we were able to put times on, dates and times, sorry, dates, on when these cracks propagated down rift, and we can make a, a, a graph of time on the y-axis versus distance down rift, and you can calculate what that propagation rate was. And, and where it makes a, a decent slope, about half a kilometer per day was the rate at which these cracks were opening up down, down rift. So that gives you a sense of how, how fast that magma was moving down, down rift in the southwest rift zone. Stage two is when Mauna Iki itself, what we know of Mauna Iki, first started to, to form. So there was Pahoehoe erupting at four, six, and nine kilometers downrift from the shield. Um, the four kilometer patch, um, I have to admit I've never visited. The six kilometer patch is what became Mauna Iki. The nine kilometer patch is something that we named the downrift shield, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then Holy Mokmo is starting to drain. 
Um, and that's stage 2A. And then just partway into that eruption, along, from this elongate initial vent that formed, a big old lava flow busted out of the middle of it and headed down rift. Um, and this was somewhat of a puzzling AA flow. Most of you probably know that, that AA flows are typically associated with high fountains and, and you know, really vigorous eruption. In this case, there was no fountaining at all. It was just an AA flow. It was channelized up near the, the upper part of it and then just flowing on down, down the um, down rift. So it's a little bit unusual. And here's a geologic map of the places that we're going to be talking about, and they're color-coded by the stages. Um, stage 1 doesn't involve Maniki at all, so there's, it's not on here. Stage 2 is shown in yellow. There's this elongate shield, much of which has now been buried, but it formed along a, a, a fissure system here. Um, this is the, the downrift shield, and there's a couple little patches as well of, of lava that erupted out. Stage 2B is this orange flow here. Um, so this is our low-tech hand-colored pen color pencil <laughs> diagram. And then here's some um, stitched together air photos. Um, here's this elongate stage 2A shield sort of. Um, the the uh, stage 2B AA flow, which is partly buried by, by later lava. So these are the, the parts of the, parts of the, the Kahu Desert that, that we're talking about. Here's what it looked like as Mariiki was starting to be built. Um, you know, it's it's a relatively sparsely vegetated area, and much of Hau, if you haven't hiked, if you haven't hiked out in that area, it's beautiful. I mean, it's part of the you know, my opinion, about the most beautiful part of the park. Um, and you know, Pahoehoe lava is inundating the, the the forest there. This is the downrift shield. So Mariiki, in this case, is viewed from the air. Mariiki would be off below us, kind of down to the right. Um, it's not very big. It only erupted for, for a short period of time. But it built a relatively small little lava shield in this place. This is an area of lots and lots of wind-blown sand, lots and lots of basaltic sand. That's one of the reasons why Martian people, the well, Martian geologists like it, because um, there's lots of wind-blown basaltic sand on Mars. There's not a whole lot on Earth. Um, the, the arrow indicates the, the position and view of the next photo. So that's that's kind of what it looks like down there, and you can see it's been, you know, it's got lots, it's collected a lot of, of windblown sand itself. <coughs> this stage two B AA flow broke out from about the middle of that elongate shield there, and it flowed down into the into the Kau Desert. And again, the flow fronts were noted by the by the contemporary reports, and they allow us to track the progression of that AA flow. It initially flowed very rapidly, five and a half kilometers per day, and then it slowed down and flowed at you know less than half a less than half a kilometer per day. But again, you know, this was when you know when we were reading this, this was 70 something years after the eruption, and yet we were able to take that data from those really good reports and say something about the advance rate of the flow. Again, be, showing how important it is to, to take good field notes whenever you're out there doing that kind of work. Here are a couple photos of what that AA flow looked like up, up at its source. It was well channelized and nice smooth pahoehoe lava with some overflows. Here, a little bit later, the level has dropped somewhat. And this channel is still there. You can go out and walk in that, in that channel. It's a really well-defined channel, and it's a great place to look at the transition from Pahoi Hori to Aa. It takes place over a relatively short distance. You can just walk down this channel uh, another couple hundred meters or so and it turns into an Aa flow. So it's a pretty classic place to take students to look at that process. And it's, you know, we've got all this satellite imagery, we can look at that as look at that as well. A little bit farther down slope, these are old photos. Um, it was it was the popular during the day, back, back in those days, to colorize black and white photos, so I gave a try at it um, with the computer, actually. Uh, but, you know, your classic channelized um, lava flow with smooth lava in the channel and a, and a rubbly ah uh -uh, um, levees in a couple of these old photos. And I don't know exactly where these were, but, you know, you go there today, and it looks pretty similar, except it's not, it's not moving, obviously. 
If you stand on the up -rift, on the downrift shield, excuse me, and look back uprift, you've got a really great view of some of this stuff. Um, here's a little remnant of the initial stage 2A ridge. Here's the main stage 3 um, profile of Mauna Iki. We'll get to that in a moment. And then here's this a uh -uh flow. It flows from kind of off the picture to the left here, down off to the picture on the right, and it's got some, got some arms sticking out. And it's flowing on, these are the so-called observatory flows. They were erupted from a, a, a vent near where HVO is, Jagger Museum is, um, probably four to six hundred years ago or so. <coughs> All right, stage three. This is when a pretty decent lava pond developed at the summit of Mauna Iki, um, and Mauna Iki itself was, was built. And any of you who've walked around well, either Mauna Iki or Mauna Ulu or remember Kupayanaha, uh, it was a, a classic satellitic shield building eruption with a small pond of lava at the summit, which would overflow every now and then, build up more layers, and some lava tubes, you know, helping to helping to build the build the shield. Um, it was almost it was mostly Pahoehoe, but there was some ah, uh -uh, and it's kind of interesting this stuff. And at that time, Halimokmo was refilling. So We'll, when we start looking at volumes later on, we're going to have to account for the fact that Mauna Iki is building, obviously requiring lava volume, and Halimakuma was also filling. And so both of those had to be supplied from depth uh, during, this, during this particular stage. All right, so back to the map. We're talking about this red stuff here. This is the main Mauna Iki shield there or, or there. This is the only photo I could find of the actual pond, um, you know, looking very much like Kupayanaha looked, like Mauna Ulu looked, um, you know, no evidence of pyroclastic activity, stuff splashing out really, just an active lava pond that occasionally would rise high enough to spill out and make new, make new lava flows. Uh, the summit of, of Mauna Iki and the, and the now collapsed pond uh, is very close to parts of the Ka'u Desert Trail. Um, so, I mean, I, there are park rangers in the room, so I shouldn't talk too much about going off the trail, but <laughs> this is one place that you can see that I'm talking about that's really right there close to, close to the trail. And if you turn around and look the other way, here's this now collapsed pond looking off to the north towards uh, Mauna Loa. Much of this summit area is very, very oxidized. So during the eruption and for a long time after the eruption, there was a lot of gas coming up out of the, you know, the remaining cooling magma. And those gases are very acidic. They, they oxidize those rocks. So this is a, a field of pretty horrible <coughs> shelly pahoehoe that's been all, all oxidized. And this is the shield viewed from the north. And you know, like a miniature Mauna Loa, and that's why they call these things satellitic shields. It's mostly pahoehoe, and that's, that's all of this somewhat gray material, but you can also see there's this ah uh -uh flow that kind of comes from nowhere. And this is something that they noticed at the time, that every now and then there would be a place where, just kind of busting out of the ground, were these relatively small, in most cases, ah uh -uh lava flows. And these are something that was also studied in, in the Mauna Ulu eruptions. So, whatever decades after that, um, Don Peterson and Bob Tilling described this, this concept of essentially lava accumulates within the shield, um, somehow, su somehow supplied from the lake or, or through some sort of tube, and it accumulates within the shield, and it sits there for a while and builds up almost like a, like a blister. And while it sits there, it cools and it degasses, so that once the pressure gets high enough that it busts out, it can't flow as pahoehoe anymore. It's got a higher viscosity. It's been degassed. And instead of pahoehoe, you get these little ah uh -uh flows. Again, without any fountaining. It's just, it's just a, like a breakout. So here's one on the north side. Uh, here's a couple small ones. Some of this lava has this really interesting texture here. Um, this has been called many things, um, including toothpaste lava, <coughs> excuse me, um, semi hoy. Um, but it's, it's essentially lava, I didn't make that one up, um, it's essentially lava that has the viscosity of a ah, -ah but it's flowing slowly. So rather than bust up into clinkers, it, it keeps a relatively coherent carapace. But because it's viscous, it can't form a nice glassy surface. And obviously, it, um, it comes out in pulses, and those pulses are recorded by this, 
by this texture here. And, and again, because its viscosity is, is relatively high, these pulses can't relax. They're, they're preserved. Um, here's a big one, um, one of these places where I'll, I'll bust it out. This whole block here was lifted vertically um, by 10 meters or so, and eventually an off flow came out this side, and another one came out this side, um, again, without any, without any fountaining. And the biggest one is described here. So there's a lot of text here, and uh, I don't know if you want me to read it. Says, uh, basically, it's, so, the, so Jagger and Finch did not go out there every day. Um, you know, it's easy now, you drive down Highway 11 and you hike out on the Footprints Trail, and you can be there in 45 minutes from here. Uh, it was not quite so easy back then. Um, so they would go out every few days. Um, and when they went out on, I think it was February 3rd, where what had been a, you know, a growing shield, suddenly there was this great big jagged wall of stuff that had been piled up. And when they made this description, uh, it, they, they were describing it as if this stuff had just kind of busted up out of, the, out of the ground right there. What it turns out is this is the side of one of these great big uh -uh breakouts. But from here, it looks like, you know, like a line of fissures almost. Here's what it looks like from the air. So that last photograph was taken somewhere here looking in this direction at this margin of, of uh -uh lava here. This is the source. The Mauna Iki summit is below us, or below here, and it's this arcuate scarp right along here. It runs kind of like this. It's sort of like a sector collapse on Mount St. Helens, for example, or Besignani. Um, except in this case, it's not a big stratovolcano, obviously. It's a satellitic shield, and it was full of lava. So when the flank collapsed, what came out was the lava that had sort of stored in here. Most of it had been there for a while, so it was not nice fluid, fluid lava, it, it, and it formed ah, -ah. Um, And you can see that it carried with it big sections of the shield that had been built here. So if you undid all of this, you moved this guy back and these guys all back, you could repair this, this collapse in the, in the shield. And it's sort of interesting, it's a negative topographic feature here, and it's obviously a positive topographic feature down here, like, like a, a fluid landslide kind of, kind of thing. Uh, the next photograph will be from here looking at the scarp of this, of this collapse feature, and then the photograph after that will be standing out here looking at the distal end of that, of that collapse feature. Here are a couple students at that, at that scarp, and you can clearly see how this dropped down from here. Uh, it's a little hard to tell, but right in here are some scrape marks. There's another one right down here, right down here. This material clearly was semi-liquid, semi at, least, at least right here. So as this thing dropped, it scraped that semi-liquid plastic lava and left behind these, the gels, we call them slick and size. And then here's the distal end of this thing. It, it looks kind of like a standard off flow, except it's carrying these great big fragments of what had been the, the shield surface. And so some of them managed to ride all the way down to the, to the nose of this, of this off flow. All right, stage four. Um, some lava tubes developed. So there had been lava tubes in stage three, but they really hadn't gotten very far. It's, it's as if they were all the same length, and they kind of went in all directions to build a relatively circular shield. But towards this last stage, the tubes managed to develop so that they could carry lava farther, farther away. And so this is when the, the Pahoy Hoi portion of the eruption went, went downrift as well. It didn't get quite as far as that early off flow, but it got most, most of the way. Uh, here's a photograph of a skylight into one of those tubes back at, back at the time. And up on the, the main, near the main summit of Mauna Iki, there's a chain of skylights. They're pretty impressive. The tube up there is, is quite large. Um, it's, it collapsed, and you can tell that it collapsed um, after the eruption because it's full of this talus rubble. If it had collapsed during the eruption, that would have all been carried away. Here's the, the front end of this Pahoy Hoi flow. It, it worked its way at a much slower rate than the off flow had. So here's um, third week of, of April, sorry, mid-May, um, 
mid or end of June, and then that's about as far as it got. So, I mean, you folks all know about palm oil high flows. They're really slow. They advance slowly along the ground. Um, a lot of it was relatively degassed out here at the, at the flow front. Um, here's a geologist in the proper field attire <laughs> looking at the, the advance of this, of this palm oil high flow. All right, um, so that's, that's the, the sequence of events, those, those four stages that we divided up. Um, but again, thanks to the cleverness of, of Jagger and Finch um, and some help from John Dvorak, uh, we were able to look at the tilt record at this time and not only look at what was going on at the surface, but, but come up with some subsurface models. And this is kind of our, our Avapuhi model of the various um, magma storage um, systems in, um, in and underneath the summit area. They didn't have a tilt meter, but what they had was a, a seismograph up at the Whitney Vault, and they noticed that the needle on the seismograph would drift kind of off its, off its track. And they were clever enough to realize that the reason it was drifting was that the ground would tilt. You know, you've heard about tilt meters at, at HVO. They didn't have one, but they could see that their seismograph needle was tilted. And not at the time, but later on, in 1929, they were able to take that um, seismic record and deconvolve the tilt into an east-west component and a north-south component. And then John Dvorak helped us convert that, that record um, into microradians and then volumes so that we could look at the volumes of input and output um, based on that, on that tilt record. And at the time, um, Jagger and Finch thought that the east-west tilt was actually a, 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 a cause, changes in east-west tilt were caused by changes at Mauna Loa. Uh, we're pretty sure that's not the case. It's a little bit too far away to, to see that kind of record. From the Whitney Vault, essentially west is Halimomo. It's not perfectly west, but it's sort of west. And the east-west tilt record pretty much mimicked what the Halemaumau Lake was doing. So east-west tilt would go up as the Halemaumau Lake was going up. East-west tilt would go down as the Halemaumau Lake was going down. North-south tilt, it's not perfectly aligned, but north-south tilt is kind of towards the southeast portion of Kilowatt Caldera, which I'm sure you all know, that's where the main magma storage chamber is. It's not underneath Halemaumau, it's underneath the southern part of the, of the caldera. Um, so when we started waving our arms and trying to, to con um, connect these tilt records with, with subsurface storage, these are the things that we're kind of thinking about. A shallow storage chamber that's connected to Halimamo, and a deeper storage that, that obviously is connected somehow, but not quite as directly. All right, there's a lot of stuff on this slide, but you only have to look at what's going on in the, black, in the red box here. Pre-eruption, Manaiki, there was none. It didn't, it didn't exist, so we'll ignore that. Halimamo had that rapid subsidence event on, on November 28th. It drained downwards, and it apparently drained pretty deep. There was no surface manifestation of this large volume of magma lost. And you'll see in our scenario, we need this, we need this later on. Um, North-south tilt uh, was mostly deflation. Um, and east-west tilt hadn't, hadn't been recorded yet. So sorry, I forgot to explain this graph. The purple dots are Halimau Lava Lake measurements, level measurements by, by Thomas Jagger. And they're relative to the rim of Halimau And so our record starts with the elevation above the rim, meaning it was overflowing. And then there's this rapid drop from here down to here in four hours, oh and then slowly climbing back up. Okay, so that's what these dots are. They're the Halimau Lava Lake level. And the elevation of Mount Iki relative to the rim of, of Halimau is shown down here. That's the elevation of, of Mount Iki. The green line is east-west tilt, and then the red line is north-south tilt from, from this time period. Okay, so that's, that's our pre-eruption time. Um, so we have the rapid drain, and then later on, um, the north-south north south tilt starts to deflate right here and are, we interpret that to mean that magma is leaving deep storage going into shallow storage. Stage one, remember stage one is when you had small eruptions in the caldera and then the cracks propagating down the southwest rift zone. Um, 
so that's the cracks going down here. Halemokmo was dropping while all those crater length crater vents erupted, um, and then it started to rise again. North-south tilt deflated and then started to inflate. We still didn't have an east-west record. And our interpretation is magma is draining down the southwest rift zone from shallow storage, and we don't need to interpret that. That's the observations show that, right? The cracks are opening up. They could see magma down in those down in those cracks. Um, uh, let's see. And uh, deep storage was filling, and we could tell that because deep storage was was showing showing inflation. Stage two A is when the first eruptions out of Mount Iki start. So that's when that kind of elongate shield was was built. Um, Halemaumau was dropping. The level in the lake was dropping. So you see these from here to here. These guys are dropping. Um, North-south tilt was inflating, so we're losing magma from Halimokmo, we're gaining magma in deep storage, um, and we're, we finally have an east-west tilt record, it's dropping as well. So here's something we'll see in a number of cases, the east-west tilt is more or less mimicking what Halimokmo is doing. And the key thing, when we start talking about volumes in a few minutes, the, the rate at which lava was being erupted out at Mauna Iki was the same as the volume loss at Halimokmo. So there was a match between what was lost at Halimokmo and what was erupting out at Mauna Iki, as if it was just draining down, down rift. And the north-south tilt doesn't seem to have been connected, connected to it. It's inflating while everybody else is, de is deflating. Then that big old outflow busted out, stage 2b. Um, and Halimokmo is draining a little bit. East-west tilt's not doing anything. North-south tilt is deflating as if we're taking magma from deep storage and losing it, and we've got this offflow coming out at Mauna Iki. We don't think that magma that was going to all the way from here out to here, and that's because that offflow is specifically described as not having any fountaining associated with it. So it can't have been fresh, deep magma. If fresh, deep magma would be full of gas. There would have been lots of fountaining. Instead, there was magma that had been stored in the rift zone, and, and in our concept, back when we were writing this paper, it's that stuff that drained out of Halimokmo back on November 28th, had been sitting there, cooling, degassing. So that it basically got pushed from here, like a plunger, and that's what came out at Mauna Iki. And you folks remember from 2018, the beginning part of the 2018 <coughs> eruption in the United States, that was old magma that had been stored in the East Rift Zone for much longer than in, in what we were saying here. But certainly this concept of older, slightly gas poor, or very gas poor lava being stored in the Rift Zone and being pushed out um, is, is something that was apparently happening 100 years ago as well. Stage three, this is when we built the main Mauna Iki shield. Um, and you can see that the, both the east-west tilt and the north-south tilt, there's a lot of ups and downs, but essentially no <coughs> change from the beginning to the end. So it went down, up, down, up, but it ended at about the same level. Similarly with east-west east tilt, up, down, up, down, but basically there was no net change in either deep storage or shallow storage. And whenever you see that, during an eruption, what it's telling you is that the amount that's coming into the volcano is equal to the amount that's coming out. And so if you can measure the amount that's coming out, it's telling you something about the supply rate to the volcano. And in our case, we have to account for two things. We have to account for the building of the Mauna Iki shield during stage three, and we also have to account for the rising of the Halemaumau lava lake. So if we can calculate the total volume gained by the rising lake, plus the total volume of Mauna Iki Shield, then that gives us a, a supply rate to the volcano. And when we do that, we come out with 2.8 cubic meters per second, which is about the same as the supply rate during the Mauna Ulu eruption, when um, Don Swanson and Bob Tilling saw basically the same thing. No net change in summit storage while there's an eruption out on the, in that case, the East Rift Zone, and they interpreted that to be the supply rate to the volcano. It also is approximately the same amount, the same supply rate, or sorry, the same volumetric flow rate as the 1880 to 81 Mauna Loa flow. And Jim Kohikawa and friends wrote a paper about that just recently. Um, and it's also the same as the Pahoehoe eruption during 1859. 
So there seems to be kind of a, you know, this is a relatively fundamental volumetric flow rate, somewhere between two to five cubic meters per second. And a number of folks, myself included, have, inclu have, have interpreted that to be the long-term supply rate for, for both Kilauea and, and Mauna Loa. <clears throat> All right, finally, stage four, um, north-south tilt seems to be disconnected. It's just inflating. Meanwhile, Halemaumau is draining. So the level at Halemaumau Lake is draining. The east-west tilt is following it. And the amount of lava that's being erupted by that long tube-fed Papaiwai flow is the same as the amount that's being lost from Halemaumau. So again, it looks like simple draining. The lava is draining out of Halemaumau, erupting out at, at Mauna Iki. The last thing of numbers you have to worry about. <laughs> Again, thanks to Jagger and Finch and John Dvorak, we can convert those tilt records and some of our field measurements to actual volumes. For Halimomo, it's we modeled it as a cylinder, and the diameter is 366 meters. That comes from Jagger's measurements. And so we can figure out for each meter of up or down motion how much volume is gained or lost. And it turns out to be almost 90,000 cubic meters per meter of change. For stage two, when we built this elongate shield, we just modeled it as an as a, you know, elongate triangular prism. Um, oh, sorry, that's stage two here. For the tilt, um, the deflection of the seismograph needle, one centimeter of deflection gets converted to 1.2 seconds of arc. Maybe you don't care about that. Um, but essentially, we can convert um, uh, almost 6 million cubic meters per centimeter of deflection. So that's how we get volumes out of those tilt, those tilt records. Uh, we model the volume of the shield. For the off flow, we just map it. So we get the area, and then we go out the field, and we measure how thick the flow is at a bunch of places. So we've got area times thickness, and we've got volume. For the main stage three shield, it's a right circular cone. We know how high it is. We know its um, diameter. Uh, or radius in this case, we can calculate a volume. And then the Pahoehoe flow, again, we map it in imagery and go out and measure its thickness. So we can calculate volumes for all of these guys. And obviously you have to, you know, these are relatively rough measurements. You have to account for vesicularity. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to bet anyone's life on these volumes being accurate, you know, to the closest cubic meter. But, you know, within ballpark, we're, you know, we're geologists. We're okay with that kind of thing. At least I am. <laughs> All right, so what do we do with this? Here's time on the x-axis, volume gained at Mauna Iki, it only goes up, and volume lost or gained by deep storage and by Halimokmo. Okay, and we're not gonna look at the whole thing, we'll look at part of it. Here's when we're, the first eruption out at Mauna Iki, the eruption rate, volume gained out at Mauna Iki, is equal to the volume lost at Halimokmo. That's good evidence that it's just draining. The lava lake at Halimokmo was just draining downrift to form that early, early part of the, the Maniki's um, edifice. Stage 2B, this is that big old uh, offload. Um, here's the volume gained out at Maniki. Here's the volume lost from deep storage. In fact, deep storage lost more than, than this volume here. But this is our um, part of our evidence that that the impulse for making that big offflow had to have come from deep storage because the volume, the rates at which volume was changing are the, are the same, even though the, the total volumes lost down here is a little bit more. Erupted at Mauna Iki and gained at Halemokmo. Remember, this is stage three. Here's the, the deep storage. Remember, there were lots of ups and downs, but the, the overall, there was no volume change from deep storage. So here's our evidence that this volume gained plus this volume gained equals the input rate to the volcano because there was no net gain or loss by deep storage. And then finally, stage four, here's the, the downrift Pahoehoe flow and here's the, the volume lost from Halimaumau. This is a positive slope because we're gaining volume. This is a negative slope because we're losing volume, but the slopes are the same. And the, and the um, the vertical changes are the same. So again, another instance where it looks like simple drain from the Halimau Lake out to, out to Mauna Iki. And then north-south tilt 
doesn't even care. It's just, you know, it's over for me. I'm just going to start recovering for the next eruption. <laughs> All right? Wow. You know what? I'm going to skip this because there's too many numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give the park folks the PowerPoint slides. If for some strange reason you want to look at them, you can. <laughs> All right. Why else do we care about Mount Iki? That's, that's the end of my summary of the eruption. But why else do we care? Well, I mentioned my Martian friends. Um, most of them will never get to visit their field area. Right? Unless you're lucky enough that your field area is one of the places where we send a rover, um, you're never going to go there. You'll get lots of images from satellites or telescope from, from Earth, uh, but you're not going to get to go there. So you have to have a good understanding of what a surface in a satellite image means geologically. And satellites cannot get resolution like this. Um, so, you know, you, it's like you're kind of blur your eyes a little bit, what you're going to, what you're going to see. Um, and so these colleagues looked, they, they came out actually on one of our, our NASA workshops that we run, and they were intrigued by this stuff. And I've always thought this is beautiful uh, material here. Um, this is degassed pahoehoe. When it's fresh, it looks like this. It's blue and it's glassy. And in fact, the HBO folks call it blue glassy lava for obvious reasons. But the blue glassy surface doesn't last very long. Within a few months, it's, the blue sheen is gone, and it starts to develop this secondary coating on it. That's, a, that's kind of our iron oxide color. Um, it clearly does not like to develop where there are pre-existing cracks in the, in the lava. So it's, this is kind of enigmatic stuff. Um, the P and the S refer to P-type pahoehoe and S-type pahoehoe, and this really gets into the weeds of, of you know, lava nerdiness, uh, but George Walker uh, at the University of Hawaii when he was there coined these terms. The P stands for pipe vesicle bearing. So this is lava that, bear, that has pipe vesicles, and I'll show you a photo of them in a moment. S stands for spongy. So this is the, the more commonly, you know, you folks are probably very, much more familiar with it, Pahoehoe that's full of bubbles. It looks like a sponge. And basically, this is the pahoehoe that is erupted directly out of a tube or at the front of a flow. This is the pahoehoe that gets stored in a tumulus, for example. And it loses some of its gas, but it's still fluid when it, when it comes out. And so it has a much lower, it, it's not fluffed up by bubbles. Um, but again, it develops this, this coating. And so these folks were pretty interested in this stuff. Um, here's some more photos. Here's some pipe vesicles. So these elongate things like pipes. They're typically near the base of a flow, although they're not always there. This stuff's really kind of weird. You know, it, it, it's a secondary material of some sort, and you can see it's formed here and it's formed here, but there's this really sharp boundary where it did not form. And you notice that this shape mimics this shape. And what this is, is a place where there's a little bit of inflation that took place back in 1920, when this eruption was flowing. So this, this flow flowed out on top of this one and probably sat there for you know, only an hour or so at most. And then this flow inflated, and the inflation process lifted it up off this flow. And you know, it was cooked for, you know, and I have no idea, I wasn't there, but you know, probably an hour or so, maybe a little bit more. But the fact that this was cooked meant that in the hundred years since, this stuff has not developed this yellowish coating on it. So something about being cooked changed either the chemistry or the physical nature of that surface, or both, so that this secondary material did not develop on here. I don't understand that part. Um, similarly, it doesn't seem to have the same color if it's in the vicinity of a small plant. So something about either shading by this plant or the water that falls on the plant first and falls here causes the, the chemistry of this stuff to be slightly different in the vicinity of a, of a small ohia plant. And then up close, it looks like lichen, but it's not. This is not biological. And again, it doesn't show up in these cracks. So they, they, they analyze this stuff, um, and it's basically hydrated silica uh, with minor amounts of iron, titanium, and sulfur-bearing materials. And it says, consistent with leaching and or dissolution of basalt glass or tephra. So essentially what happens is you get acid rain falling on this glassy material. And it, it soaks into the glassy material. It dissolves 
some of the some of that glass <coughs> migrates back up to the surface and then evaporates and leaves behind a silica, you know, the stuff that gets left behind as that water evaporates. It's kind of a um, mostly silica. Basalt doesn't, you know, basalt is 50% or so silica. Um, so basically, what this acid rain is doing is scavenging silica from within the basalt and then depositing it up as this yellow material. Um, yellow or blue material. So then it says, similar alteration conditions are thought to have occurred on Mars. So this is your, your reason why NASA would be willing to pay these folks to come out and, and study this kind of stuff. And you've got to admit, there are parts of Ka'u that look like Mars, except if you ignore the plants. Um, here's a, a nice basaltic sand, sand dune out near Mauna Iki. And as I said earlier, basaltic sands are pretty rare on Earth. Obviously, we've got a lot here on Hawaii, especially at beaches, but non-marine basaltic sands are, are not very easy to come by, nor are basaltic sand stones. You go to Mars, they're everywhere. And here's a sand dune on, on Mars that the, that the rover drove by about four years or so ago. Here is, I'll let you guess. One of these is Mars, and one is Kaku. <laughs> this is a scale bar. This is one centimeter. Okay, so these are little guys. The wet one is Kaku. The which one? The wet one. The wet one? Uh, yeah, darn it. <laughs> okay, we're almost to the end. So because this area is, is got some nice analogs to planetary surfaces other than Earth. Um, it's a good place for teaching, it's a good place for research, and, and our department and other departments have collected a lot of data, satellite data or airborne remote sensing data, that's similar to the kind of data that we have for other planets. And this is a really good place to train planetary geologists who, like I said, are never going to be able to visit their field area, but they, but they are going to make a lot of maps using satellite data, and they need to have an understanding of what kind of, what different things look like in these different remote sensing data sets. Uh, and here's a place out, out um, near the downrift shield. Obviously, trees are not something they're going to find on the other planets, but we've got some windblown sand. Uh, we've got an offflow nearby. Here's what the area looks like in a visible light image. This is what your eyes would see if you were in a plane or a helicopter or satellite looking straight, straight down. The sand is oxidized brown color. It's basaltic. It's been oxidized. Trees are green, obviously. And then the aha flow is relatively dark. And aha flows are dark mainly because at, at a small scale, unless you, unless you put your face right in it, there are a lot of shadows. Right? Aha flows are so rough that a lot of what you see is shadow. Thermal infrared. So this is temperature, and in this case, it's not, you know, this is not a Matt Patrick helicopter thermal camera image. Um, this is all warmed by the sun. These are differences by th the surface being warmed by the sun. And so sand is hot, right? And you know that if you forget your slippers when you go to the beach, <laughs> sand is hot. If it's dark sand, it's even hotter. Um, and the reason sand is hot is that it's really difficult for these sand grains to conduct heat away from the surface. They only touch each other at tiny little points, and it's very difficult to conduct heat across these tiny little points. Dense rock conducts heat away much more easily. So if you have a choice, if you go to the beach and you forget your slippers, walk on the sidewalk, don't walk on the sand. Even if they might be the same color, same sun, but it's going to be a lot cooler on the sidewalk. Trees are cool. Evapotranspiration, or transpiration, makes trees cool. Aha flows are cool. Again, that roughness means two things. One, they are self-shadowed, so a lot of that aha surface doesn't actually even get any sunlight. Also, they're really rough. They're like a radiator. And so, like the radiator in your car, the reason it's got all those thin fins on it is to maximize the surface area. The greater the surface area, the more you can radiate heat away. So rough aha flows are really good radiators. Uh, we have thermal infrared images of Mars. We have visible light images of, of Mars as well. Synthetic aperture radar is perhaps not quite as familiar. Essentially, this tells us roughness, whether a surface is rough versus smooth. And if a surface is dark, that means it's smooth in one of these radar images. If the surface is dark, that means it's smooth. Windblown sand is very smooth. 
If a surface is rough, it's bright in this image. Trees are rough, and a'a uh -uh is rough. This is the type of data we have for Venus. The only images, visible light images we have of Venus are the two places where the Russians landed a couple of little landers that only lived for 10, 15 minutes, but they managed to get some images back. All the other images of the rest of Venus, we only have radar data, bright versus dark, smooth versus rough. Again, so we have all these data. We give our students three weeks to come up with a geologic map. They vary in quality, as you might guess. And then we take them out there. And for a couple days, they walk around and ground truth their maps. And they, they navigate with GPS. And it's very cliche, but it's true. The places they get wrong, they learn a lot more about than the places they get right. So they basically have to say, OK, this place is brown in the visible image, it's bright in the radar image, it's cool in the thermal image, I'm going to interpret that as an old oxidized AA flow. And they go out there, oh, it's an old oxidized AA flow, great. And they move on. Or, but if they said, I can interpret that as a young glassy pahoy hoy, and they get out there, it's an old oxidized AA flow, what did I get wrong? That's where they learn, that's where the real learning happens in, the, in their brains, which is what, which is what counts. That's the answer key, but I'm not going to show it for very long because it might be a future <laughs> student in the room. <laughs> not everything out there is volcanic. These flakes of glassy pahoy hoy were deposited in this low spot here um, by the November 2000 floods. So those of you who were here, I'm sure remember, um, it really rained out in Kahuli. <laughs> Um, and these things were, were picked up, <coughs> scraped off by flowing water, and then deposited in this low spot. And this is not the best example of it, but they're kind of all, they're sort of all stacked like this. This imbricate stacking is something that sedimentologists care about. Like you see in, in stream gravel deposits, all the pebbles will be kind of stacked in the same um, orientation. And you can say something about the flow rate and the flow direction from this kind of thing. And then finally, the famous footprints. Yeah. So the, this is an excellent place to see footprints. And in fact, as I, I think, these were unknown to Westerners until the Mount Iki eruption. And Roy Finch went out there to study the eruption and happened upon these footprints. You, that may be wrong, but that's what I've heard. Is that that's when they were, quote unquote, discovered, at least by, by Westerners. Oh. Uh, the question is, how is basaltic sand created? Uh, it, it depends on what environment you're in. Down at Kapoho, it's being created by waves crashing on young lava flows. Up here in Kau, basically it's the wind blowing across glassy pahoehoe flows. Um, Pahoyo flows, as they cool, the surfaces tend to crack just by thermal contraction. So there's a lot of loose pieces. A good gust of wind will pick up some of those pieces, blow it along, it'll tumble, it'll crack into smaller pieces, and pretty soon you've got sand. So it's, in this case, it's just basically being gusted on by wind and fragmenting in that, in that process. So is that happening shortly after the Pahoyo flow? Has, has it, it certainly can. Um, if, if you get it, I don't know if we'll ever get to again, but if you get a chance to see a pahoy hoy flow flowing, um, you sit there and you watch this thing in, in place, and if you sit long enough, it'll start to crack, and you can even hear it. And if you watch carefully enough, you see little pieces busting off. And, and if you stay hours and days, you'll see that as it contracts, the surface of the flow is really it's kind of detached from the, from the part below. Ka'u is a very windy place, so you take all those detached pieces, start blowing them around, they start breaking into smaller and smaller pieces. And so your basaltic sand here is fragments of that glassy crust, plus any mineral crystals that, are, that, are, that were included in that as, as well. So if the sand forms shortly after the eruption. It starts to form shortly after the eruption, but it continues. It, it's, it's not, I mean, there's sand 
forming out there right, well maybe not today, it's not much wind, but you know, today there's still sand being formed. Yeah. So, you, you know, in high school you get the model of a volcano and it's pretty simple. You get a cone and underneath is just a flow of lava that's coming from the Earth's center. Right. And you mentioned, I saw the drawing, you, you showed the drawings and you said there's a, um, a, a chamber where the lava is deposited. So my question is, how is that maintain, uh, maintains its warmth? Oh, okay. sorry. That's a great question. The question is, how do you maintain the, <coughs> excuse me, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a, an active magma chamber, a molten magma chamber. You basically have to have a, a sufficient supply to counteract the cooling and crystallization and erupting uh, that's going on. Um, and, and if the supply dies or trails off, such as when a Hawaiian volcano moves off the hotspot, eventually the magma chamber solidifies. So it's basically you need to have sufficient supply to the volcano in order to maintain a molten active magma chamber. And that comes from the center, from the core of the Earth? Not, not the core. Um, it, it comes from what we call a hot spot. And, and a hot spot is not the, we're stuck with that term, but it, it's probably not a spot. It's probably more a column of rising, this is the part that's hard to conceive of, rising solid rock. And as it rises, it's really hot, but it's solid because the pressure prevents it from melting. But as this column, at the top of the column, the pressure is less and you can get some partial melting. And that occurs about 100 kilometers down. And it's that that comes through some sort of poorly defined um, distributary system that eventually dribbles up and collects in the magma chamber. So there's uh, a guy who used to be at UH would call that the zone of intense arm waving. And, uh, you know, and we've got a seismologist who will be quite cringing, but you know, that's kind of as well as we understand it. There, we know that it comes from somewhere about 100 kilometers down, and it comes through some sort of pipe system that we can't really image seismically very well until it gets closer, closer than that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any opinion on what just happened in New Zealand? Ooh. <laughs> it was awful, um, and and it was it was bound to happen. So White Island, White Island is a very different volcano from Hawaiian volcanoes, obviously. Um, it's it's active, it's it's more explosive, and it's got a very active hydrothermal system. So there's a fumaroles and a lot of a lot of gas, um, and that's why people go because you can see this active hydrothermal system. But you get explosions in these hydrothermal systems, not because you get a pulse of magma, but just because you get a pocket of water that maybe gets trapped. Um, I don't know exactly if that's what happened, but the, the problem with these hydrothermal explosions is they're much harder to predict. You don't get a tilt record prior, you probably don't get a seismic precursor of any kind, it's just you know, suddenly some pocket of steam or water gets to the point where it flashes to vapor and you've got an explosion. And that may trigger something bigger. The, the photos I saw, or the video I saw on, online looks like it was more than just steam. There, was, there may have been some magma involved as, as well. But White Island had exploded a number of times before. And in fact, there were a whole bunch of miners killed there in I think the early 1900s. So they were mining sulfur on White Island. And there used to be remnants of their mining camp. And there was an explosion that killed like 30 of them. And after that happened, it was off limits. Until 20 or so years ago, when there was pressure put on the New Zealand government to allow <coughs> tourists to go. Um, so a, a pretty awful event. Um, but I think it's sadly not really a surprise. Right? It's just really lousy timing that that particular explosion happened when there were a whole bunch of people there. Yeah. I, I'm guessing it will be off limits again. Yeah. Even volcanologists couldn't go prior to the, you know, the really opening it up to tours. You could go, there were air tours um, and boat tours going around, but actually landing on the island was not something that was allowed until somewhat recently.
Let's do one more question, Dr. Roland, and then we'll wrap up so that people okay. can go. Okay. You want to go? All right, we're both. Okay. Oh. We're not. What do you know about those two pit craters that you go on the Mount Aichi Trail? Mm. Do they have anything to do with what you've been talking about? There's mm. like, it looks like a fresh lava flow went into one of them at least. Sure. So he's asking about the two pit craters that are along the Kau Desert Mount Aichi Trail. Um, they're related only in the sense that they're along the southwest rip zone, similar to Mount Aichi. Um, and pit craters formed by, there are a couple of mechanisms that have been proposed, but essentially they involve collapse into some sort of void. Right? They're not something that explodes out, because we don't see the debris. All we see is the holes. Right? So, at, and they're old. Those, those pit craters are relatively old. Um, so they formed long before Maniki oh. formed. The flow that goes into them, I think is from 1974. I believe it's a 1974 flow that just happened, part of it, just happened to flow down into one of those two pit craters. So they're related in the sense that they're part of the, the whole rift system that involves deep, deep magma transport and shallow magma transport and collapse down into those transport <coughs> systems because the whole thing is spreading. But a direct relationship to Mauna Iki, I don't think there really is one. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Right, yeah.